this talk is about defying expectations. Seven lessons from The Sims Replay. So first, a little bit about me. So I'm Mavis. I'm the lead product manager at FireMonkeys. I've been with EA for more than five years. More than three of it was spent on The Sims Replay. Previously, I worked on Shooters and Ubisoft Singapore, where I started as a monetization analyst. My background is both in business and analytics. And I've spent more than eight years working on free-to-play titles on both PC and mobile. So the agenda of what we're going to cover today. So first, we're going to cover some history. Um, we're going to start by anchoring ourselves uh, on the product life cycle. And then we'll go through each stage and the ensuing lessons that we've learned. And finally, we'll sum up with some takeaways. So first, some history. A bit vague, but um, some, some of you may or may not know, Fire Monkeys is an EA mobile studio in Melbourne, Australia. Um, it was formed through the merger of um, acquisition of two indie companies, Iron Monkey Studios and Firemint, and they creatively named themselves Fire Monkeys. So the games that we've, we're currently running include The Sims Replay, Real Racing 3, and Need for Speed, No Limits. Previous titles include Flight Control and Spy Mouse. So let's go back to the beginning. What did The Sims Replay actually start out being? So sometime in 2009, 2010, the initial plan was to port existing, uh, existing premium mobile Sims title that, it had, that, that the studio had to iPad, um, where I think in 2010, that was where the iPad was slated to launch in April, and the studio wanted to kind of take advantage on the first mover, um, being the first mover on a new platform. However, as, as the team neared its um, end of its development cycle, the EA Mobile label decided that instead of premium, it should go free to play. At that time, that kind of made, made sense given the whole movement you know, in, in social games on Facebook being all free and very successful. Um, next, it did, did not really make sense to be iPad only given that free to play games work best with a large funnel. So therefore, you know, the, the plan was made for the game to be on both mobile and tablet. So the label didn't quite understand or know what live services meant because at that point, all we were shipping were premium titles of which the expectation was really for us to, you know, keep the game around and kind of, you know, um, where the game would really only last for like one to two years of expected lifetime and, and revenue. But as I'm speaking here today, since Replay has been alive for more than seven years uh, in live service. So how do we do this? And how do we defy the expectations of our longevity um, and the genre platform fit? So it starts by anchoring ourselves to the product life cycle, which I find is an interesting theory that fits quite well, particularly for the Sims Replay and the way our revenue and performance kind of mapped onto this theory. So the seven lessons that we'll be covering today map alongside this, and there are different challenges in different stages of the product life cycle. And what I like, mo like most about the product life cycle is that it reminds us that life service is a marathon, not a sprint. So let's start. Well, the first stage is development, which from my personal experience is one of the most challenging parts of game making primarily because you have no revenue and you have high uncertainty. And as a product manager, you also have no data. So I would, you know, I guess an analogy that I frequently use is, it's like being stuck and in a long, dark tunnel where you're walking with a group of people and hoping that you've picked the right direction to walk in. So decisions that in this stage have a large impact on the product. So this is why the first lesson that we learned at this first stage is, the foundation setter, where we're trying to answer the question, how can we start right? So development is risky business, and in 2010, um, the good part about being on a new platform is that you are at the cusp of crazy growth. However, the other thing that's pretty bad about it is that you really don't get, don't have that many, you know, references of what good looks like. You kind of need to figure it out. 
in development, we ask lots of questions. Things like, where do we start? What do you build? What should the gameplay be? What should the meta be? How are we going to attain, retain, and monetize? And how can we make good decisions while lacking good, you know, lacking any data? So I suppose with some good fortune, the Sims Free Play team was able to leverage some of its existing strengths and manage some risk. So as mentioned previously, Fire Monkeys has a long, you know, a pretty strong legacy of building um, of building mobile titles even before smartphones were around. There was a similar team that had previously shipped premium Sims titles. So they were familiar with each other and also familiar with the brand on mobile. So that was how we leveraged some of our strengths. A key unknown was free-to-play. Um, the studio had no experience doing free-to-play. We were one of the first free-to-play titles that were launched by EA Mobile. And we didn't quite know how do you turn a sandbox simulation game to be free-to-play. So how do we mitigate unknowns? Well, you honestly make some guesses and just try to use your best judgment of studying some successful competitors in the market, of which clearly there were some in the social Facebook space. Um, and I guess again, good fortune you know, was that the development was time boxed because historically, at least at that point with premium mobile titles, we really needed to ship them quite quickly and you really couldn't take your own sweet time. So that meant that you know, while you while were taking risk, you were forced to make decisions and just get it out. So these are some of the foundations that we ended up picking. Um, just so if, you, if you're not aware of how the game works, this is kind of like the core loop and the, the you know, broad meta. So players have sims who they just give them appointments. For instance, in this case, we're asking sim to do a movie marathon. Um, set up the appointment, it takes time, and then in exchange, once it's done, you collect simoleons and XP. XP that you know, obviously gives you progression in your player level. And simoleons you can spend in something like the build mode store where you have small amounts of spend. And then you go into the town map, which is uh, in a higher level where you can spend on building more houses and community lots, which lets you expand your sim town. So these were the foundations that we, you know, we kind of set the game upon. And so to summarize, um, the foundation setter, well, first thing is you need to be honest, leverage what you do know and mitigate what you don't. Generally, you try to resist the temptation to innovate on everything because if you do, you, there's too many, you know, too many ways that things can go wrong. And lastly, there's no recipe for su for success, right? Like there's, you know, there's no kind of fixed thing that you can do where you guarantee any sort of success. You just need to be exercise your best judgment. So from development, we're going to launch. In launch. But usually, you know, hopefully you're lucky enough that you get high installs and then with high installs, your revenue spikes. Your return is normally not that great because perhaps your, your team is quite large at that point or maybe you haven't quite figured out how do you actually drive your, your key KPIs. So in stage two, it's the puzzle solver where we really try to solve the puzzle of life service, answering the question of how can we set the game up for long-term success. So to give, you know, to give Sims, Sims, Sims Replay, to use Sims Replay as an example, at launch, this is what a DAU, you and know, I'm roughly mapped at. Um, the Sims is an extremely strong brand and well, well loved. So, you know, it naturally came with really strong installs. However, you could see our DAU started to slide in, and it seemed like a life, initial live service plan wasn't quite working out. So what was wrong? So I think, to answer that question, we firstly need to understand what life service actually is. And I, the way I understand life service, it's, it's like a puzzle, which you have to kind of do under, under time pressure. There's a couple of elements that you're working with. That includes dev time, you're, de you're spending development time to get some sort of output, of which the output is then drive some of your numbers, like your installs, retention, and revenue. So how best you kind of solve this puzzle uh, will determine your success. The problem is that development time can be spent on multiple different things like maintenance, events, content, new features, a whole heap of other things. And it's how you find that balance of managing the input and output that effectively lets you get the best results in order to try to achieve some growth. So, 
different games will definitely face different problems at launch. And in Sims 3 Play, the first thing you had to do is really try to identify what was wrong. So through, through updates, our live service plan was basically to put content directly into the build mode store. Remember, again, this is more than seven years ago, and there really wasn't a lot of compar you know, competitor games that, that could kind of give us uh, some guidance. So we put the content in the store, and then we saw the numbers, or oh, you saw the slide. Um, and the reality is that you know, just putting things directly into the store really doesn't quite sustain DAU because players can just consume the content immediately. If I want that sofa, I'll just buy it. I don't really need to wait four months, oh no, four weeks to buy it. And the problem was that, you know, the way we were delivering content was not giving us the return that we needed. So and we needed to really find a way to retain players for longer. So how do we solve this problem? We knew that, yes, the problem was the way we, we were delivering content, so we figured a different way of delivering it. So one thing that the team experimented with was the notion of quests. We started putting content behind quests, where players had to engage in a quest in order to win content at the end. And how it works is pretty, you know, it's really quite simple. The update drops, players have to go through a quest for five to 14 days, actually engaging and sticking around. And then, you know, if they're successful, they get to win the content as reward. So this is some UI showing both the timer, the prize, as well as progression, as well as the story that, that we have to kind of write for the, for the quest. So it worked well in extending the life and content lifespan and helped to solve the puzzle. As a result, we started seeing numbers move, start moving slowly upwards um, as we started introducing quests more and more in our updates and DAU gradually started to grow. So to summarize, lesson two is a puzzle solver, where the first thing you have to do is identify your key problems at launch, and then solve, use you know, live services and solve that puzzle of live services. And solving the puzzle is actually really key to actually having a viable product. If not, all your numbers start dropping and you know, it really doesn't make sense to continue, really continue running live service. So after launch, we go into, this is probably the best stage because it's where you feel kind of invincible, but it really is the growth stage where revenue starts to increase. You can start reducing your costs and your return actually increases. It's worth noting that of course, if you take too long to actually invest in growth, and if you don't realize that you're actually, you've solved the puzzle and you're not, and, and you're, you're kind of moving to the growth stage, you will be missing out on a chance to really quickly, you know, kickstart, um, you know, some of the growth of some of your numbers. So lesson three is the growth investor, where we try to answer the question here, which is how can we scale? If you've solved the puzzle, you know what works, how do you scale? So the Sims 3 player is a simulation sandbox game. Um, and as I explained previously with the quest, it, you know, we, we work best, we, the, we basically know how to drive our numbers provided that we know how to use content. And given that we've solved the puzzle of delivering content, now what we need to do is just increase, one thing we need to do to scale is to increase content production. First thing we do, did was grow the internal art team. Now we know where if we build more assets, you can drive more KPIs. The benefit about growing the internal art team as well is that um, it allows us to work more on outsourcing as well, which multiplies the amount of content that you can put into your game. As a result, over the past seven years with every update, we've been steadily adding assets with every update. Um, some numbers include like we have more than 6,000 build mode objects and more than 11,000 customization and clothing options. For a simulation sandbox game, this actually has the added benefit of making it real, really hard for new titles to compete. And if you have any sense of how the market is, um, a lot of the titles that, have, that still continue to be in the top grossing actually tend to be quite old because they actually get stronger over time. By virtue of the fact that you know, it's, if it's a simulation sandbox with the more options that you give players, the more likely they are going to just stick with the game because it allows them to tell more stories and just do a lot more. So the next thing that we did to try to scale and grow, 
and investment growth was to reduce costs. So we, did, we reduced costs through tools. Tools help to reduce engineering time, which is highly valuable and um, really shouldn't be spent on repetitive things like live events. Um, engineering time could be better spent building features. And the other thing that tools gave us was the opportunity to empower other disciplines. Like for instance, we have the data tool for tuning where, engineer, uh, where designers can, can just you know, kind of put in tuning without needing an engineer. Same way with Quest, when we knew that um, Quest were working, we started to create templates for Quest so that it was just, in general, that there was less room for error and then design could, could put things in with minimal code effort. Uh, we built sales tools so PMs could create sales and rerun sales easily without needing any code. And for we also built a scheduler too, so that if we, in the event that we needed to move our events around or just push in new events, we could do it extremely quickly. Another thing worth noting is that definitely there are economies of scale where the more we do something, the better that we will get at it. So the third thing that we did to invest in growth was to actually look at the features themselves. So we knew that quests worked. However, of course, once the quest ended, you would see your numbers drop again. So what we figured was we should just chain all the quests together. Where here you can see an example, you know, examples of the different quests that unlock at different levels, like cooking or the spin plan um, or horses, for instance. And for a simulation sandbox game, this is quite interesting because it gave players a path to progress, to progress where they could unlock features um, where if, if not everyone is extremely creative and not everyone knows how to set goals in a sandbox space, but now with this sort of progression that we're able to offer players where as they level up, they get an opportunity to play through quests that unlocks new features, which makes them feel like they are really kind of growing and expanding the possibility of what they can do in the game. So this helped to strengthen our baselines in general and to give players something to do in between updates and in between events. So the fourth thing that we did to invest in growth was this really cool thing um, where we started looking at user-generated content. So houses are actually very expensive for us to build. We, it takes an artist probably you know, several days um, just to put the house together. And this is just using our assets that exist. Um, however, it's highly demanded and valued by players. As you saw briefly previously, there was a town map and players actually set goals on when I want to put all these amazing mansions on my town map. But real problem is that we just could not afford to build them. So we built this feature, which is one of our most successful features, called the Architect Homes, which allows players to submit their houses. And we actually pick them manually every two weeks and we, you know, data push them out to players, allowing them to both preview and purchase. I would say that you know, by this feature has been around for years and more than 80% of our houses are actually user-generated houses. Effectively, this removes us completely. With the exception of picking, it removes us completely as a bottleneck for content. And it allows players to kind of showcase what they've built. And to, to, a, to a large extent, the, the things that they build are way better than anything that we could build. So to summarize lesson three, um, in the growth stage, what you really want to do is invest in growth. Invest in the thing that works, and clearly as explained, you know, there are multiple ways of investing in growth. Um, you can gain efficiencies in content creation and consumption, that's basically the goal. And if you don't know much about simulation games really, they actually do get stronger over time. And the opportunity cost if you can't scale, there's definitely opportunity cost if you you're not trying to scale when the time is right. So the paradox of content. Well, it's easy to say, let's build a pipeline. Let's just, we know content works, let's just build lots of content, right? Um, so we know that we need to build content. We know how to build it. The real problem is what should we build? So this Afro guy says that if you build it, they will come. But the reality is no, that's not true. And we learned that the hard way by building things that players just didn't want. 
Um, and the difference between a good content that people want and a dark content can be more than 50%. An example that comes to mind is Christmas. Uh, Christmas events tend to, tend to be our biggest and most expensive events because it's great seasonality. So this, there was one Christmas where we decided to go fantasy. We were like, oh, fantasy, you know, it would be quite cool. The update dropped, the event started, and then on Facebook, people started asking, where's the Christmas event? So there's a really painful lesson because players, you know, if they're, if they're not really into it, they're just not going to actually play it. So lesson four is the keen listener. And we really we're trying to answer the question here of what should we build? And surprise, well, at least for The Sims, we have a great audience, so the players will tell you. Since we play audience skews younger, they're highly vocal with lots of opinions. And the challenge or the thing that we have to do is actually just manage those channels. So we use channels like Facebook, Twitter, EA runs this thing called Game Changers with our community managers. We have forums, websites, and customer support, as well as internal channels where we actually ask questions, um, like customer satisfaction surveys, user experience research. These are all the different things that we do in order to get a sense of uh, what should we build, what do players actually want. Some of the things that we can learn include what content do they want. When it comes to surveys, we actually brainstorm a list of things like, you know, do they want Venetian mansions or you know, do they want submarines or do they want to be in space? We actually force them to kind of stack rank it. And that is how we use to prioritize our content roadmap. We ask them things like, what would you like to see again? And that's something that we also use to um, plan our calendar of reruns. This is something that we can tell actually through telemetry, but because we have different sources of information, triangulating that is normally quite a good thing. Sometimes you also come up with hypotheses of what some features might be, like for instance, professions or pregnancy. Um, these were all things that we had hypothesized and then we put into a, a survey and then figured which ones were actually work the best, so which, which ones were actually most highly desired. And also understanding how the players feel about the features that we release. For instance, you know, how many people are actually using the relationship system? How important is it for them? And trying to get a sense of, should we actually iterate? Should we spend any time optimizing this system? Lastly, it's hard, but sometimes it is possible to try to understand some of their motivations, the kind of why. Why do they actually want this thing? Um, it's it's challenging given that we are a simulation sandbox and different people have different goals and different reasons for, for wanting certain things. But most recently we had done a customer satisfaction survey that kind of clarified something that gave us insight to something that we had never we never thought of actually. So hair is something that does very well in our game. Um, it's been doing very well for years. It's something that players have always been, this is an example of hair, Players have been asking for on, on all channels for for years, and we've always, you know, we've started running like a hair hobby event, and we've since added more hair hobby events and more hair live events. Our understanding of why players wanted hair was basically, you know, we just thought that they just like customization, and hair is just cool. And um, another another thought that we had was that hair is actually. Um, some you know, hair means more because our hair that we had launched initially with the game were, didn't look very good. So as such, players actually wanted more hair. So in the customer satisfaction survey that we had run recently, we asked why did you really enjoy this recent boutique hair life event, and um, it gave us some insight that we never. Um, it kind of gave, gave us insight that we had never thought of, at least in the development team, who have been building hair for years. You know, we, we didn't actually realize this. So the insight was, look at this. This is our sim tracker. The sim tracker is something that we use for, uh, that players use to select between their sims because players have lots of sims. Some, some players have 30 plus sims. And then look, if we look a bit closer, you can notice something. So players actually want hair 
because sims have the same face. And hair is actually, you know, cheaper for us to create than face. Um, but this was insight that we actually didn't realize because of us. The sim track is actually really small and you know the tiny little thumbnail of sims meant that players of all same face sims meant that players actually couldn't tell them apart. So with more hair options, they now had more ways of solving that problem in ways that we didn't ever think of. Um, so that's one of the things that you get to learn, and I think it's pretty cool to learn that years after we've been you know, beating the drum of hair is great because players just like hair. Turns out there's actual utility in hair for our players. So to summarize, lesson four, the keen listener. So we are our target audience. That's pretty clear. Sims we play is um, skews young and skews female. We have to build multiple channels to both listen and ask questions because of um, how much it costs to develop content. Um, this helps to guide our development and guide the way we do things so we reduce this risk of things not working out. And this is something that's really relevant all throughout the product life cycle, although perhaps more relevant when you actually have a product out there. So we move on to stage four, after growth, which is the real fun part, you go into something called maturity. Here, you know, your revenue kind of flattens, you can still continue to reduce costs and your, your return is perhaps increasing but not as fast. Hopefully you hit maturity years into your life cycle and not like immediately, because that would be quite strange. Um, and, Operating this long at a fixed pace of maybe six to eight weeks, uh, you ship an update, it's, it is fast, it is fast paced. There's always going to be mistakes um, in live service and also general issues that kind of snowball as you keep kicking the can down the road for many years. So lesson five is the fixer, which is how do we recover? So for mistakes in live service, there are several categories. The obvious ones are bugs, of which if you worked in a simulation game, they're always very hilarious bugs, of things clipping each other and whatnot. Um, as mentioned previously, there's mistakes of not getting the content right, of which that's really hard to fix, right? Like if, if you invested, you know, lots of days building something and you kind of need to launch it effectively and then you just probably won't launch it again. Next one is not getting the feature right, which is quite common given that we, at least in Sims Reaper, we don't, we don't really soft launch our features. We don't really have a way of testing whether it works or not other than playing it before we relaunch it. These sorts of mistakes impact following, including stability, sentiment on social channels, and feature and rent performance. So in general, it's, it's you kind of need to decide how you deal with it. And like any good life service, you will need to have a triage process of which you kind of evaluate the severity, the impact, and kind of decide how urgent it is to fix. Using the different channels that we mentioned previously, you have to communicate transparently and as well as obviously, um, I guess, timely. And with the other mistakes, you have to kind of try to find a way to deal with them based on the impact of uh, what, is, you know, what it's currently causing, as well as the return of what it can get you, perhaps, if you solve it. You have to consider both the risk to player sentiment and KPIs, given that we are a live game. If you start changing things, players will notice and they will talk about it. So are you prepared for that? In general, rule of thumb is that if you are going to change something, it's easier to add something than it is to remove it. So another, it's not, this is not really a mistake, but it's just something that applies if you're running a long-term life service. It's the weakening foundations. Um, these are some challenging things to overcome in a state of maturity. So one of the things that happen, would happen is diminishing returns. If you keep doing the same thing over and over, an example would be sim count. We give players sim count if they level up so that you know, they get to add more sims to their sim town, which is great. Um, but like anything that, any reward, the first, the first few times, maybe the first 10 sims is great, but you know, by the 30th, 35th one, is, is it as valuable or is, you know, do you still feel as much joy from getting it? 
Um, then they add a problem, of course, you know, scalability, like as previously seen, the SIM tracker is going to keep, you know, you need to place where you have to, to keep scrolling through it. The next thing is expectations. So this is interesting because good design means that players know how to set expectations. However, it also would hamstring us because something like quests, for instance, is a fixed way of doing things. Players expect it to work in that same way. And even if we find ways, problems with it or ways to optimize it, players understand the rules and they're not going to be super happy if you start changing things around them. Um, at the same time, they've also ritualized and figured out a solution of min-maxing it. So that's something that you kind of need to take into account knowing that um, the longer you run your live service, the more likely that players will have build up those expectations. The next is anchoring. For on the PM side, you know, obviously if you if you anchor too low of a price, like when I mentioned previously, it's gonna be quite hard for you to increase it, at least immediately. And when it comes to rewards, uh, we, tend, we tended to go really big with our, whenever we launched a new event where we went like, you know, here are heaps of rewards and here are super high quality ones at the same time, only to realize that we can't actually keep up that pace. Um, so that's quite hard um, because, you know, in live service players are like, but the other event was much stronger. You know, I expected more, and, but yet, you know, you, you kind of can't keep up that pace. So we have to be careful and thoughtful in how we solve these problems because it is it, it, players have been used to something and you can't just you know it's not great to pull the rug under from under them. So lesson five is immaturity. It's the fixer. It's normal and expected to trip up. Sometimes they're game breaking things, so that's where you trip immediately. Or there's weakening foundations where you do a slow motion fall basically. Uh, you have to be prepared to fix bugs with an effective and uh, triage process. And regularly try to assess the fundamental problems in your games because it keeps changing as the foundations weaken and things change and consider solutions. Um, this we found um, quite hard to do when you, you have been working on the title for so long. It's hard to take a step back and then kind of evaluate what, what's, you know, are, are we doing something wrong or actually what's happening? And we found that a good solution to this is actually to bring new people in. Um, with a set of fresh eyes, we were able to find things like, you know, we were pricing certain things the exact same way because our engineering team was just duplicating the price and we forgot to actually price things. So these were all things that we uncovered when we brought new people in. And finally, be both careful and thoughtful with weakening foundations. So you can learn things clearly by making mista mistakes, but live service is primarily about launching and learning. So in six week cycles, um, you learn by building, measuring and learning. I look at every update as an opportunity to try new things and learn something. So I think that's a good approach to have. Two ways of testing hypotheses include launching and then measuring after. Or of course, during A-B testing, uh, multivariate testing, where you're trying out different variables and seeing what works. For both, an important, a very important principle applies, which is we have to set up your expectations and hypotheses in both instances before you actually do the thing. So this is, this is one of the key ways in which you sharpen your judgment. My personal view is that it really doesn't matter if you're completely inaccurate of saying like, for instance, if we do this thing, the uplift might be 10 to 20%, and then in reality, it might be 40%. It doesn't matter because you took a stab at it. And then, you know, it, it prevents you from falling to the trap of confirmation bias, knowing like, yeah, I knew it would increase, but you know, you said 10 to 20%. So now you can adjust the way you're thinking to get closer to understanding how features perform in the future. So lesson six is, the validated learner, which is how do we really make sure that we are learning and not just trying a bunch of things? So with A-B testing, general principle is to try to test changes where we're not certain on the impact. If you really know that it's gonna do something, unless you're trying to optimize it further, there's really no need to test it. 
A couple of things that we have done include optimizing the first time user experience, where if you know anything about simulation titles is that there are heaps to teach players, and we wanted to reduce the number of steps. The real problem here with Sims 3 Play, I, I believe, was that um, creating another first time user experience so it was a really expensive task. So that's the problem with A-B testing. If you're gonna test something that you've really spent so much time on, you are much more likely to just go with the go with the thing that you spend time on anyway. Um, fortunately, I think, I believe in this instance, the, for the, the test cohort was the winner, but only marginally. The next thing that we wanted to test was quest progression. So after five, six years of, of adding content, we actually found, found that we had the problem of having too much content and players were, were actually not getting to the content. They were leaving before they saw the cool things. So we figured, okay, maybe let's you know, shake it up. Let's try to get players to the content sooner. And we wanted to shorten the, the length of time it take, took to go through the quest. So again, this was a quite expensive endeavor because you had to change a lot of the tuning and you had to go through testing through the entire progression. Again, here yeah, the, the winner was the shorter quest, but however, it only marginally, because um, my suspicion here is that time it takes is actually just one, one thing, uh, one thing that impacts whether the decision, decision of whether players decide to stay with your game and retain. Um, another thing that we optimized was where features were unlocked. Again, we had a hypothesis here was that if we put feature X earlier in the game, maybe they will retain better because players now have access to more features. So this again fell into the, you know, I think we, again, we didn't quite realize that we, we still had a problem of having too much content. So moving more content earlier, again, probably didn't, you know, really didn't do anything in this case. So another thing worth noting is that be wary of the cost of testing every small change, because every time, at least at least on Sims 3 Play, it wasn't super cheap to do everything. It was reasonably cheap, but it was still time. It was, it was still time setting up the test, figuring out what we should test, as well as you know, QA time. So when it came to validating uh, learning, in the stage of maturity many years down the road, one of the things that we actually found was very hard was storing the lessons as memories. So most ideally, you imagine that we're spending years of doing something and all the mistakes and lessons that you've learned, we would like to build on the lessons of the past. However, this is a major challenge as, as we age because team members really in reality do not stay on the title forever. And that knowledge is normally, you know, disappears with them, or at least different bits are left behind, but not everything is left behind. This is hard because the team executes better if they understand why and how we got here. We don't have answers for this. We don't have great answers, at least. We do have some things that we do with discipline, like we do an update telemetry review after every update, looking at our performance, looking at the things that we've tried and how they perform. Uh, we do some basic documentation um, and we do things like that. This, I guess, give talks and hopefully the, um, you know, there, there are some hand-me-down lessons that uh, the new team members will learn. Uh, I really discovered that this was an issue when our team was trying to figure out how can we, what can we do with, with quests? And this was seven years in and I came to the realization that most people had no idea what had we tried before and what worked, what didn't. And in fact, a lot of the best practices that we had put in place previously had just been rolled back because of the different handovers that we had kept keep doing as we changed designers, as we changed PMs. So what we did at least um, was the PM team put together all the different analysis that we had done on quests, which was heaps, because we had tr tried anywhere between 10 to 15 to 20 different new things with quests in the, the course of the years. And the good part was that they were all documented in the telemetry reviews. So we created this massive quest retrospective document, uh, PowerPoint that we then presented to the team, explaining what worked, what didn't, what, what drove numbers, what did, did not, and where the opportunities were. And we presented it back to the team. And once we did that, we found that at least, you know, everyone started with close to the same amount of information, which then allowed us to then build on top of that uh, in terms of what, what else can we do.
But this is a lot of effort, and um, this is something that you know we really have to take into account as we go through a, you know, hopefully what, what will be a very long life service. So lesson six, the validated learner. Every update is an opportunity to learn. Set up expectations ahead of time in order to improve your judgment. A-B testing is generally a really good way of measuring impact as well as uplift. And lastly, have a, have a good plan to store lessons so that new team members can avoid making the same mistakes. But granted, sometimes people do have to make mistakes in order to learn. So this is kind of like, you know, um, you just have to figure out how, how best do we do this. So the product life cycle is, I guess, a very convenient theory and hypothesis. Not, you'll find that not every game kind of matches it really one to one, but that's not really the point. The real challenge, you know, it's not really about knowing how, they, how the stages work. It's actually about knowing how long each stage, each, each stage will last, because for every game, it's different. Some games, well, unfortunately, they don't last very long. For some games, like since we play, they last a long time. And the challenge here is that, you know, if you don't really know how long you're going to be in each stage, how are you really going to plan and act for the future when you might feel like, oh, yeah, I can be in maturity forever. That's great. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a whole point about knowing the product life cycle is knowing what's next so that you can act now. Because after maturity, we go into decline. Here, your revenue decreases, your costs perhaps stay the same, and your returns reducing. So it's, you know, the reality is nothing ever stays constant when there's competition and the market shifts every day. So it's only natural that we're constantly fighting aging. Um, given some three place age, we face declines multiple times and it's natural and we constantly have to fight to stay relevant. So why do we find ourselves in this state and how do we get ourselves out? So the first is, you know, the, the paradox of strategy. A strategy works when you're, you're in that life stage, but then it normally stops working once the context changes. I mean, context changes can happen when the markets change in terms of growth. Like, like I showed the, the chart of smartphone growth, for instance, you're clearly not in that state anymore. Installs are stabilizing, if not decreasing. Um, the market size, you know, if it stays the same, preferences change, competitors come up. And formula reliance is great when you actually know that you can invest, but then it's a problem once you move out of that phase. So what happens is that it ironically puts us in a path towards both player and um, developer fatigue, where they've been doing the same thing and expecting the same thing for a long time, when they really actually want something else. So the real hard part that we found is that it's particularly challenging to build for a difficult stage, you know, to, to tell, tell the team, for instance, like this, you know, the good days are not gonna stay forever when you are in the good days, right? Like that's, that's all have, has always been quite hard. So lesson seven is the perpetual challenger where we really try to answer the extremely difficult question of how can we live forever? And it starts by really acknowledging that, um, after years of doing the same things or similar things or trying new things, that we've built up a legacy and the legacy is shackling us. So this is a, a term that our producer had coined to try to you know, encourage the team to think differently, that we have to break the legacy shackles. The main challenges here is that we are spending development time on things that don't work as well anymore, hence reducing you know, reduction of our return due to things like weakening foundations. We are doing the same thing, but getting just less in return. Processes were set up for us to do the same thing over and over, when in reality, we actually should be trying new things. And we have to overcome inertia by identifying what are the key problems again, which are now different, and build innovative so solutions. So if we can do that, then effectively you kick us into a new stage of sort of like growth, but it's what you would term in the product life cycle as the product extension. So this kicks us into, you know, gives us more life, it gives us more years. So how, how do we do that? Sims Replay has done this multiple times by developing entire, entirely new features that give new experiences to players. And each time that we do that, we are finding more ways to stay relevant. So we do so by embracing reinvention, 
where our goal here is to take a longer horizon when it comes to developing features. We are trying, we are trying to, to build something that has longevity for two, four, two, two, two to four years, um, not just let's, you know, let's build something where players can consume it in, in the next six weeks. Because if you do that, then you, you know, you'll find yourself very quickly ending up in a decline state. The next thing is it's very important to align the team. Yeah, you need to stay ambitious. So that's interesting. Um, I mean, that's in the maturity phase where you go, you know what? The numbers are not really moving. We actually should try to kind of push them harder and embracing change in order to get there. When we develop features, um, we develop them with the goal of really hitting three different things. One, they have to hit our hopefully new and ambitious business goals. The next is they should hit what the players want, which we should have figured out by being keen listeners. And lastly, they should also fix some problems that we would definitely encounter over time. So that's ambitious, but you're basically trying to, to build something that hits all these three goals. The features that, some features that we've introduced over the years that have managed to move the needle include um, we, we shipped a new live event system where the goal here was to actually remove uh, reduce design time substantially and allow us to kind of push out content to players with minimal effort um, while still allowing players to earn lots of content. So by doing so, we, we basically were able to grow the life ops return and you know save a, a lot on design and, and code time, which can be used on, used on um, feature development. Another thing that we did was professions, which we had found was something that players had wanted. This grew the baseline. It helped to solve a problem of not having um, second to second gameplay uh, that um, in the game because the game is, is is basically all about appointments. Next, we built pregnancy and shipped it last year, which was one of the most highly demanded features. Again, the goal here was to to um, grow the baseline and reduce reduce the amount of effort that we had to spend in maintaining um, more event systems. So here, players could actually, um, they could just opt in to a pregnancy event and you know they just go, yes, I want to start this pregnancy event. It lasts for nine days. And they get to go through the experience of pregnancy, or at least the sim gets to go through the experience and they get to win cool prizes as a result. The last was the VIP system, which was a hard one to, to attribute any lifts to. But what we found was that um, in, in the C sets, lots of spenders actually reviewed that that was one of the key motivations for spending. So that was actually quite quite an interesting finding. So lesson seven: in the state of decline, if we're trying to kick ourselves into um, into extending the product, we really have to be perpetual challengers. Because firstly, it's too easy to to cruise on success especially when the good times are here. And we have to have ambitious goals or keep trying to do better um, and have actually good plans on getting there. It helps to think long haul because life service is a marathon, not, not a sprint. And develop features that satisfy your business goals, player wants, and fixes the problems of your game. And lastly, be prepared to face the legacy that has obviously been built in the game. So there we have it, the seven key lessons that we've learned over the seven years across the product life cycle. So clearly we've been quite busy. We have, we've had to set foundations, solve some problems, invest in growth, keep listening, fixing things, making sure that we're learning and constantly challenging ourselves. The lessons have been the blood, result of the blood, sweat and tears of many of the team members who have cycled in and out of the team over these years. However, fortunately, these lessons remain, and as we get new team members onto the project, they still continue to actually guide the way we operate. It's a strong legacy that we've built that keeps us alive, and hopefully we'll do so for the years to come. So finally, some key takeaways. One, the product life cycle of free-to-play games. Um, this, at least I personally feel, re reflects quite well on um, what a live service works, at least on Sims Replay. Our performance actually quite clearly um, maps onto this very nicely. Where we have to understand the stages and determine the one that you're in. 
And then once you understand that, be prepared for the challenges that are coming or the challenges that you're already facing. I've dropped some tidbits about how simulation games actually work. And primarily, they are very content-driven. And um, as, a result, as a result of surviving for longer, they actually get better over time. Lastly, free-to-play live service is hard but rewarding. And you know, there, there really is no re recipe for success. It's just an approach of understanding this is roughly how life service is, is going to work. This is how the product life cycle is going to be. Then how best should I kind of navigate these waters? Because you'll have different problems. Uh, your game will have many different issues that are not issues that, say, a simulation title like Sims 3 play face would face. But with the right approach, um, hopefully you get to learn multiple lessons that will both determine your success as well as shape your future. So to conclude, finally, well, the at launch or even before launch, the Sims 3 Play team, I don't think a single one of them ever thought that we could have ever made it this far, right? Um, we never thought that we could turn a premium simulation sandbox game into a staple that millions of players continue to play and, and continue to love. So if there's anything that you can take from this, it's really you just have to be brave, you have to keep learning, and then go out there and defy some expectations. Thank you. I believe we have some time for questions and also a reminder to rate this talk. I have a question. Yes. Um, during the development phase, obviously there's a ton of uncertainty. You don't have that user base to get the, the information. What would you say are sort of the baseline sort of indicators and metrics, however sparse they may be, that you're looking for before you actually launch a game? Um, because it would seem kind of, kind of like a bet the company kind of thing to come out with a game without having some level of understanding about how well the game is going to do. So um, given that, say, you have some reasonable amount of time to sort of build up maybe a smaller user base to kind of learn, what are sort of the things that you would try to hit before launch um, or have some trending metrics that would give you a good understanding or some measure of confidence that the launch is going to be not a complete failure? Yeah, I think um, when Sims 3 Play launched, that was when there probably wasn't any good best practice around what, what to do at launch. But of course, you know, more recently, or at least in the past few years, we do lots of soft launches or betas and things like that. I would say retention is probably the first thing that you look at. Um, but like anything, as any product manager would do, you are making assumptions on everything, like acquisition, and you know your installs, your retention, as well as your monetization. Um, if you can't keep your players, there's no way that you can drive any revenue. So I would say retention is a big one. Um, but I'm actually personally quite interested in how do you actually forecast installs or test installs, um, which so far, I think there are some ways, but I haven't quite... Uh, figure it out. Um, the way of mitigating that risk is using strong IP like um, The Sims, which is clearly an advantage that we have. Um, but definitely retention will be the thing that I'll be looking at. So, quick, quick follow-up. Is there a specific retention sort of number that you look at or? Well, I, it really is in your short term and then you go into your mid and your long. Yeah. Any other questions? No, if not, that's it. Thanks for coming.